What precious gifts God has given this church. If you can't preach after that, you might as well just fold it up and go on to the house. Um, bless my heart. Uh, it always does. And uh, I'm thankful that you're here. And uh, I appreciate so much you not staying home. You know, they have said through the years that when the cat's away, the kittens play. And sometimes when the pastor's away, people, is it not on? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you want me to speak up? Okay, I'll get there in a minute. Um, Laura asked me last week, I think it was, what I was going to preach on today. And I told her if I were to title it, I would title it The Iconic Jesus. I'm sure you noticed the music this morning. Every bit of it was about the iconic Jesus. Um, I hope you'll hang in there with me. Uh, we're going to take a little, I'm going to read some scripture, and then I'm going to take maybe what you might think a little detour, but, but I will get back. So just hang in there with me. Our scripture is found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2 and in, kind of in the middle of the, the Christmas story. And it's such a heartwarming, beautiful passage and I want to read the entire passage. And then we'll get back to it a little later, okay? And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just that is, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male would be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. <clears throat> she did not leave the temple complex, serving God night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. We're all familiar with what an icon is, and Loretta and I were talking in Sunday school about icons, and if we were to somehow bring the Mona Lisa, you're familiar with that, right? And hanging on the wall over here, we could safely say that the Mona Lisa is an icon. It's the only one of its kind. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the iconic Jesus. An icon is an image, a figure, a representation. Uh, we deal with them all the time as we deal on our phones and our computers. Uh, Webster defines iconic as having the nature of an icon. Wow. Or done in a fixed or conventional style said of certain statues and busts or paintings, my ad. 
Jesus is more popular than ever. But what Jesus are we talking about? We live in a culture that says, uh, you believe whatever you want to believe, I'll believe what I want to believe, and, and I have my truth and you have your truth. Well, I got news for those people. There is absolute truth. We find it in the book. Um, in a recent book by the chair of the Department of Religion at Boston University, and we know that's a hotbed of evangelistic fervor. Um, it's all spelled out. Jesus is a man nobody hates. According to research, Stephen Prothario reports that roughly 85% of the U.S. population is Christian. These are some statistics. You need to listen carefully. Of course, that includes many who, people who have not been to church since they were baptized as an infant or as a child. But even subtracting those, there are a lot left. Prothero says that two-thirds of contemporary Americans say that they have made a personal commitment to Jesus. And three-quarters of our countrymen and women say they have sensed Jesus' presence at some time or other. And that's not all. Almost half of America's non-Christians believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and resurrected from the dead. And by the way, we need to teach some of our seminary professors that that's the truth. Not so bad anymore, but used to be really bad. In America, Jesus is very popular. Thing is, what Jesus are we talking about? Protherio says in his book that Americans have a history of continually remaking Jesus to resemble our current hero types. He distinguishes this popular chameleon savior from the living Christ of faith. He calls him a cultural Jesus or the American Jesus. He says that Jesus has been interpreted, reinterpreted, construed, misconstrued in the messy midrash of American culture, end quote. Over the years of Americans, America's history, this remaking of Jesus gradually separated him from the creeds, from the scriptures, and even from Christianity itself. Some people even claim that the religion about Jesus and the religion of Jesus are two different things. Once he has been separated from scripture and from theology, it is easy for Americans of any ilk to embrace their own version of Jesus. Prothero identifies four different Jesuses <clears throat> that have shown up in American Christianity, plus several reinventions of him that some other religions have welcomed. There are four. Number one is the enlightened sage. This was the Jesus that Thomas Jefferson envisioned. Jefferson spent a few evenings scissoring out of the Gospels all the references to miracles and Jesus' divinity. He ended up with a slim volume he called The Philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus prayed to God and believed in an afterlife, but he did not die for anybody's sins. Jesus came to teach, not to save. And there are a lot of people that... Uh, are like Jefferson. They believe the same thing today. And the people of the Jesus Seminar, if you're familiar with that, are in the boat with Jefferson. Number two is the sweet Savior. This is a product of the evangelistic fervor of the 19th and early 20th centuries. During that era, the style of preaching changed from doctrinal dissertations to storytelling. And the life of Jesus, often embellished by the man in the pulpit, became the central subject. The call was to an intimate walk with Jesus. Jesus was more a buddy whom we could come to know and hang out with rather than an object of faith. To make this work, Jesus had to be described as approachable and friendly, meek and mild, rather than harsh and demanding. This was much more to be felt than thought about. This Jesus was a person you could have a walk with in a place where the dew was still on the roses. Number three was the manly redeemer. And this was a reaction to the sweet savior concept. Beginning in the late 19th century and elbowing its way into the 20th century, Jesus as a testosterone-powered hero came to the fore. 
Books with titles like The Masculine Power of Christ and The Manhood of the Master Appeared. This manly redeemer was no more linked to the historic creeds of the church and to the scripture than was the sweet savior. But this one was more vigorous. This Jesus brought with him strenuous demands, and he was the one who was ready to lead Christians to war against the social ills of the culture. Then there was number four, the superstar. In the 60s, a Jesus movement began among the youth counterculture. Many saw Jesus as a revolutionary, a leader of an underground liberation movement. I remember in those 60s when a young man was told by his dad that he needed to get a haircut and quit wearing sandals and robes. And the boy kind of turned that down. And a little later, the boy came and asked his dad if he could borrow the car. And his dad said, son, you know, Jesus walked everywhere he went. <laughs> that was one of those parenthetical thoughts. That would have been my dad, by the way, had I been in the same situation. Uh, when that movement fizzled in the 70s, that Jesus emerged unscathed and became the subject of the rock musicals Jesus Christ Superstar and Godspell. He was thereafter adopted by rock groups and rap singers and heavy metal bands as an upbeat guy who offers an experiential high that is better than drugs. Eventually, this Jesus morphed into the figure on whom is built Jesus t-shirts, bumper stickers, posters, and other collectibles. And this Jesus has also influenced the Christian music industry as well. And some seeker-sensitive megachurches. Um, and then the Mormons. That's, that's enough of Protherio, but the Mormons have their own verses, versions, of, versions of Jesus and I'm not going to get into that. We don't have time, but they got, a, they got a bunch of them. The upshot of all of this is that while many Americans cannot agree on religion, doctrine, worship styles, the role of the Bible, the place of church, social action, political position, and a host of other things, a great many find common ground of sorts in a sort of Jesus or at least Jesus as they picture him. But is this collection of Jesus's the person we meet in the Gospels? It's like a room full of 25 Elvises. <laughs> Will the real Jesus please do something? One place to think about this is in our scripture where Mary and Joseph encounter Simeon, and this is a very heart-touching passage to me and let me put a parenthetical thought here it, it kind of fits uh, we're all familiar with Mary did you know the song one of the greatest lines ever penned in a song and Mark Lowry wrote the the words uh, is Mary when when you kiss your little baby you've kissed the face of God what a line people uh, but here we find Simeon, this devout man had been looking forward to the Messiah showing up. And when he sees Jesus, he takes the baby in his arms and praises God. He knows the one he is holding is the one he's been expecting. And someone overhearing Simeon might have thought he was inventing a Messiah or something. The subsequent life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus proved Simeon right. Simeon didn't rely on his own hunch about this baby being the promised Messiah. There were two critical things involved here. Number one, Luke tells us that Simeon was steeped in Hebrew scriptures. His terms describing Jesus come from references in the book of Isaiah. Simeon was basing his pronouncement about Jesus on scripture. And number two, Simeon was being guided by the Holy Spirit. These two sources of understanding, one inward and one outward, still stand today as a means of deciding who Jesus is. If you're going to decide this morning who Jesus is, those are the two things you need to consider. 
The first place to look to decide who Jesus is is the Bible itself. And what I'm about to share with you is certainly not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but there are a few things. Uh, listen to some answers found in the Gospels about who Jesus is. He is the one uh, who, after he was baptized, lived up to his baptism every day. He's also the one who proclaimed the good news of God, preaching repentance and announcing that the kingdom of God had begun. Jesus is the one who was so filled with compassion that though it sometimes seemed to get in the way of his proclamation ministry, he still took the time and energy to heal the sick. Jesus was the one who embodied the very authority of God and whose life embroidered the deeds of God on the fabric of human experience. Jesus was the one who did not shun bad company, but who called them also to repentance and a place in the kingdom. Uh, the most definitive words that Jesus said about the gospel was when Zacchaeus came down out of the tree. And I don't know when Zacchaeus was saved. I don't know whether he was saved while he was on his perch, on the way down, or when his feet hit the ground, but he was saved. And Jesus, when, when the people complained, the religious people, even his disciples had some things to say, Jesus said, the Son of Man, referring to himself, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And every one of us sitting in this building today need to thank God that that's the truth. Jesus was the one who did not shun bad company. I guess I already did that one. Jesus is the one who repeatedly withdrew to pray. Jesus is the one in whom his contemporaries recognized a special connection with God. The disciples were a little concerned and, and questioned Jesus about who he was or when they were going to see God. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. One of the questions I always had in growing up is, will we ever see God? Cogitate on that a bit. I think the only way we're ever going to see God is when we see Jesus. Like I say, cogitate, you can do that later. But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. True statement. Jesus is the one who rose victorious over death on Easter and thus is living today. I remember my friend, uh, Jay Strike, the evangelist, um, in one of his messages that he preached at one of my churches sometime or another when he did a revival for us. He said he went to, to where all the graves are and you know they visited this grave and that grave and when they entered where the area was, people would say, shh, be quiet. But he said when we got to the, the tomb where Jesus was laid, they said, come on in, he's not here. What a great statement to make. I mean, just rush right on in, everything's fine, he's gone. We are all affected by the various images of Jesus that have floated around in our world. And all of these things have shaped our thoughts about Jesus. And unless we read the scriptures thoroughly, we may find ourselves confusing the American Jesus with the scriptural Jesus. Or more likely, mashing the two together. A little piece from this one, a little piece from that one. We need to understand Scripture and listen to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit in order to understand who Jesus really is. Simon held the child in his arms and saw the salvation of Israel. Whom do we see? Uh, that's the operative question. I want to share a personal experience with you as we wind this up. Uh, and, and we had some interesting discussion at Sunday school, just Loretta and I, and we had some interesting discussion. And uh, the subject came up, can you lose your salvation? And of course, uh, I don't believe you can. Uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And once I'm, I, I was born into the Miller family. I was born Robert Lester Miller after my grandfather and my dad. And there's nothing I can do for the rest of my life that can stop me being Robert Lester Miller. That's the way I was born. And I can't be unborn. Uh, same way, we're born 
into the family of God through the birth pains at Calvary, according to Isaiah 53. And uh, so I can't become unborn. I'm born into God's family. I shared this on Wednesday night. I'm thinking maybe the first time I did Wednesday. But I want to do it again. Um, some 50 years ago, I was pastor in East Fort Myers, and my daughter was, like I said, approximately 50 years ago. I'm not real sure how old my daughter is, but she was seven at the time. And um, don't tell her I said this. But uh, we had come from Fort Myers to Lakeland. We had purchased a car. We had a Volkswagen, a 66 Bug. And we had come to Lakeland to pick up our new-to-us car. Uh, 64 Pontiac Bonneville, beautiful two-door hardtop. And, of course, my, my wife and our son got to drive the, quote, new car. And my daughter's name is Chesna, C-H-E-S-N-A, not Cessna. That's an airplane. So Chesna and I got to ride in the VW all the way to East Fort Myers. For those of you ever been that way, you can go 17 to Arcadia, and then you take a little jog and you go 31. Which the first time I went, I said, this place, this is not getting anywhere. There's nothing down here. Anyway, we got down there, and my wife had said, Bob, you need to talk to Chesna. She's been asking some questions. And I said, okay, this might be a good time. So I, I said to her, I said, babe, do you understand what daddy's talking about when he says something like, uh, have you asked Jesus to come into your heart? She said, she, she nodded. She's very reticent. And I said, have you ever done that? And she shook her head, no. I said, would you like to do that? She shook her head, yes. I said, well, you just asked Jesus to come into your heart and you can pray out loud and ask him to do that and um, We'll just pursue it that way. And, and I said, wouldn't you like to ask Jesus to come into your heart? Not out loud. I said, well, babe, I can pray out loud. You pray silently and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And I had to explain to her that I could pray with my eyes open. I didn't want her to think we were going to have a wreck. I prayed, and when I finished praying, I looked at her, and I said, Babe, did you ask Jesus to come into your heart? She said, Yes, sir. I said, Did he? She said, Yes, sir. Hardest question I ever asked my daughter, I said, How do you know? She, called, she said, Because he said if I'd ask him, he would. That's it, folks. There are people in the world who attend church every week, every service, who are someday going to stand before the Lord and God's going to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you, because they never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I'm relatively sure that everybody sitting here this morning has asked Jesus to come into their heart. But just in case, childlike faith is where we go. I trust God because he said he'd do what he'd do, and I asked him to save me, and he did. That's my prayer, that the iconic Jesus, this Jesus about whom we have sung this morning and we have heard such beautiful music about, um, he is my Savior. And my Lord, I have never seen him, but I will one of these days. And uh, if it's for the rapture, uh, I'm okay happening sooner. If it's the other route, I'd like the old gospel song used to say, uh, wait a little longer, please, Jesus, you know. Uh, I'd, I'd wait a little bit. But to know Jesus Christ the creator of the universe as my personal savior is vital to my life as I hope it is to yours. And we pray.
Father, I pray that you would bless us all here this morning. You know our hearts, sometimes even better than we know our hearts ourselves. So I pray, Father, that you would help us all to understand where we are in a relationship with you. And I pray, Father, that all of us would understand that we must have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. And amen.